everyone and welcome to my channel Knitted Art History where I'm sitting telling you some art history stories while well, knitting, crocheting, like whatever and uh, well, welcome to another video where we are going to be talking about an artist as I promised in previous one so today we're going to be talking about uh, one of the most prominent Ukrainian artists or the, you know, the one who is basically like a, at this point already, like a textbook artist for us so like everyone knows knows him or at least his works maybe not you know uh like if he will just go outside and ask people for his name maybe people will not remember his name but definitely will remember his works so yeah and well today i'm gonna be doing um another stuff i'll be crocheting today so i hate crocheting and for all of you girls out there who are being like, well, crocheting is so easy, it's way easier than knitting. Like, girls, what are you on? Literally, because <laughs> I don't know, I don't know how you're doing this. This is like, it's way harder than knitting, I believe. And well, at least for me, you know, I understand knitting like completely. Like, I understand what you need to do, you know, with decreases, increase, whatever. Here, I don't understand anything. I am, when I'm doing some, something, I need to just have this instruction in front of me and you know and i'm like re-watching some stuff for like three four or five times in a row so yeah so i want to so i mean i saw this video i will link it down below obviously of this creator and uh so i want to make also such a sweater with this like granny squares so i was doing like a present to my friend and i have some you know yarn leftovers but i still believe that i will have to buy a little bit more than that and uh, yeah, and I mean, like those. I made like you know this um, cover for books, so for books for your iPad, something like that. And I, and I mean, it, it looked very nice. So I thought that I will make something. So I already made two of these squares. So I think, I mean, again, it looked very nice, and I think like the sweater like this would look also pretty nice. So this is what we're gonna be doing today and talking about Pomonenko and talking about uh, some paintings and well we'll not get into deep analysis of his paintings but I mean uh, just some of them are I, I like them very much so I will share my uh, thoughts and feelings on them maybe but overall yeah so without further ado let's dive into our topic today so I'm in working mood I have my hook and everything so yeah, today definitely I will not show you the end result because the chances that I will finish it today are not just like low, low, they are below zero. So yeah, so but eventually in one of the videos one day I think I will show show you the result <laughs> because I mean I need I think she said that we need like 70 something, 70 plus squares. I have two already. So let's see how many of them we will crochet today <laughs> so yeah so i'm all cozy and warm and let's start crocheting and while well, talking about makola pomonenko so i managed to catch a cold somehow overnight i don't know how it happened but it happened but well this is how my voice will sound till the rest of the video and maybe sometime will sound like i'm suffocating but i'm all right but uh, yeah let's get into our topic today so Mykola Kornilovich Pomonenko, he was born on March 21st, 1862 in the then suburb of Kiev, which was called back then Priorka. Now in modern days, uh, this is part of a Kiev and we call this district actually Kurenivka. And he was born in a rather poor family. So Mykola's father was uh, the son of a slave. And well, if some of you already saw like other my videos on Ukrainian topics, I will mention it. I was mentioned that uh, a few times already that slavery in Ukraine was abolished in uh, 1861, so one year prior to Mykola's birth. And so Mykola technically was already born this like free man, but he was coming from the family of slaves. And uh, well, Mykola's father, uh, about him a little bit, so he was engaged in wood carving and had an icon painting workshop. So he himself was, as we can say, like kind of an artist. So from the age of 11, the boy traveled constantly with his father to different nearby towns and villages. Uh, I mean, uh, nearby Kiev, and some of them actually now are uh, are like part of Kiev. 
And uh, Cornelio Danilo in these towns and villages, uh, he worked uh, for churches, like in churches, and he carved some altars, he painted these churches and altars and etc. And his son, who was, um, so we can say at this point, his apprentice, he rubbed some paints, he washed brushes, primed boards, he copied contours, he executed some simple ornaments even at some point, and monochrome sketches. And this numerous... Uh, creative, as we can say in modern words, business trips involved the boy in his father's profession and at the same time imprinted the first impressions that would define the worldview of any artist for the rest of their life. In the future, actually, Mykola Pomanenko will be called the praiser of, of the Ukrainian village. And, uh, well, as uh, a poor family, Kornilo Danilovich, so his father, did not have the funds to train Mikola to be to become like a professional artist. And in addition to the boy, there were uh, like three more sons, if I'm not mistaken, and actually one uh, one daughter. So it was a big family. And um, the maximum that the icon painter managed to do was to place his 13 year old descendant in the icon painting school of the Kiev Pecherska Lavra. So Kiev Pecherska Lavra is the a monastery in here in Ukraine, in Kiev, specifically in the center of Kiev, and it's uh, like one of the oldest uh, one on our territories. And uh, different point of time, it was uh, some art center, and a part of icon painting. There were also some uh, like when the book started to be printed. So we had a very big uh, printing. Uh, workshops there and stuff like that so we have actually a full museum on the territory of Lavra now about uh, book printing in like on, on Ukrainian lands so that was uh, a very prominent place and well, still is actually and uh, why he was able to do that so you will ask because you know like he didn't have money and everything but the system here was very interesting because uh, pupils uh, who wanted to master the basics of icon making were representatives of various social strata here. So starting with uh, some clergy and ending with peasantry. Everything happened according to the law here. And uh, for this purpose, there were such things as contracts. Um, so these contracts were concluded between masters and students for a period of minimum five years, up to 10 years. And according to those documents, the mentor had to maintain and teach the student like complete so you you didn't have to pay anything but you needed to work and you you know and students uh, needed to be completely obedient to their mentors and according to the educational process the icon painting workshop of the Kiev Pechersk Lavra had its own like original system of artistic education at the first stage young people mastered the basics of depicting some plants and natural landscapes animals and bit by bit people also in the second grade or second course as we can say students studied basics of icon painting and practiced monumental painting numerous educational drawings by students of the Pechersk painting studio works of local teachers of the first half of the 18th century, in particular some prints, including many portraits of prominent church and political figures, have been preserved still, and they are somewhere in the archives of Kiev Pechersk Lavra, I believe. So in the icon paint in school, the boy was noticed by a famous Ukrainian artist, uh, Mykola Murashko. So I will make a video about him also, because again, he is also a very important art figure in Ukrainian art. And uh, Morashko was a founder and a director of the Kiev Drawing School. The school was founded with the funds of patron Ivan Tereshchenko. And uh, so Ivan Tereshchenko, I already mentioned him when I was talking about uh, the history of the museum of Bogdan and Varvara Khanenki, because Varvara Khanenko, she was Ne Tereshchenko. And Ivan Tereshchenko, it was um, her uncle, actually. And overall, like Tereshchenki, they were like millionaires back then. So it was enormously rich family. Uh, they were like sugar uh, sugar kings, as we can say. So they were like producing, uh, they had a lot of manufacturers that were producing sugar. And they were like the main developers of, um, like one of the main developers of art and culture in Ukraine. And uh, yeah, and Ivan actually, if I'm not mistaken, also he was, um, he had the first ever public uh, gallery in his house. So this is also pretty important. And Murashka persuaded Tereshchenko to take little Pemonenko to study for free in this Kiev drawing school. 
And quite quickly, the Kiev School of Drawing turned into the center of artistic life, not only in Kiev, but also in a large part of the southwestern region, as uh, Ukraine was then called. In the informal Academy of Arts, a wonderful museum of painting and graphics emerged. Uh, school leaders participated in the preparation of city art exhibitions, etc. In addition to thorough knowledge of drawing and painting, Mikola Murashko students also acquired general knowledge. So, for example, some plastic anatomy, history of art, history of literature, and just oral literature, and etc. All of these were included in the educational disciplines. Pomenenko's wife, Oleksandra Orlovska, so we will be talking about her a bit later, wrote his biography. And there she mentioned, Mikola Ivanovich Murashko was an excellent administrator. His drawing school also had general education classes because the teacher tried to make the students fully cultured and well-educated people. Every Saturday, parties were arranged for students. The professor gave various lectures there, drama and opera artists, writers and musicians came. Those evenings ended with youth dances. So, starting... In 1878, Mikola Pomonenko mastered painting at the Kiev Drawing School, where he gained practical experience in the workshops of famous Ukrainian artists and teachers. In a second year of study, the teaching staff recognized Mikola Pomonenko as the best student, actually, and they transferred him to the main class, as it was called, and enrolled him in the school staff as a tutor of younger courses. All of this uh, grace, grace to you know, talent and hard work of Pomonenko. Murashko also repeatedly wrote to the Council of the Imperial Academy of Art in St. Petersburg with a request to grant his student the title of drawing teacher. And finally he succeeded, and in 1881 Mukola Pomonenko received a drawing teacher's diploma in lower general educational institutions, and for the next six months he was teaching youth uh, in Kanyu, so this is a city in central Ukraine. In uh, 1882 he decided to apply to the St. Petersburg Academy, and he successfully passed the exams and in September of the same year became a free student of the pedagogical courses of the St. Petersburg Academy of Art. This is a touch that testifies uh, to the level of education actually at the Kiev Drawing School because that autumn, a part of Mikola Pomonenko, there were 11 more pupils, 11 more students of Mikola Murashko that entered the Academy of Arts for a second. And all of them were very successful in different drawings and sketches from nature, sketches of composition, and etc. Well, however, still, uh, only one of them quickly passed the first class, or the first courses, we can say, and uh, like this uh, course of training. And in six months, in January of 1880, uh, 1883, I'm sorry, he transferred to the next live painting class. So Mikola Pomenenko studied in the live painting workshop of the Ukrainian painter uh, Volodymyr Orlovsky. So yeah, Alexandra Orlovska, it's his daughter. And um, so Volodymyr Orlovsky uh, at, at that time became famous for numerous commissions executed for the crown-bearing family of Alexander III. And Orlovsky taught his students this, um, oh, we can say, so I found this word, like European, Pianese, something like this, uh, that is the artistic tendency to dissolve in the surrounding worst world, as we can say, to feel and see the picture with the heart, but he did not approve of ex uh, excessive realism, as well as Mikola Pomenenko's membership in the Society of uh, South Russian Artists, this is how Russian Empire called Ukraine back then. Meanwhile, due to uh, inflammation of the lungs that turned into tuberculosis, heavy poisonous vapors of oil paints, the rotten climate of Norse also, overwork and financial hardship, and most importantly, the unfriendly attitude of teachers and students towards Ukrainians. In 1884, Permanenko left. He left the St. Petersburg Academy, and at the same time, the Council of the Academy already managed to award two small and one large silver medals uh, to the work of the, uh, at this point, he was 22-year-old painter for success in drawing and so this is like this system that was in um back then in uh, like imperial academy so they were given this medals different stuff like i will not get into, get into the detail but it was just for you to understand it was very important obviously so Mikola's uh, Mikola Pomenenko's teachers primarily Ilya Repin and Volodymyr Orlovsky with Ilya Repin they met actually each other in Kiev drawing school and they became a very close friend till the rest of their lives, actually. And when Mukola Pomenenko died, Ripin was very upset and he was, like, mourning him. And, uh, well, both of these teachers um, 
reluctantly let the young man go. They had such a high opinion of his level of painting that they were okay with him not attending uh, like in-class trainings. So for the further exams, the Kiev native was even allowed to just mail new canvases to the Academy's current exhibitions, which he did for the next seven years until he finally received a painter's uh, patent, it's called like that, basically, which means a diploma. Of course, the doctors unanimously advised Mikola Pomanenka with long-standing tuberculosis, which had taken on a severe form, to urgently go abroad for treatment somewhere to the water, uh, or at least to go to Crimea, for example. However, lack of money and also elderly parents did not allow him to do that. So the young artist was satisfied with the rural air, imbued with the sense of the forest, the steppe, because he went to the village of Malutyanka. It is not very far away from Kiev itself, and um, which in later years became an effective panacea for him and a cozy hiding place for the storms of, of life, as we can say. So Malutyanka occupied a special place in the life and work of Pomonenko. Even in his youth, so it was, you know, he knew this place because he was traveling here with his father for work. And um, 11-year-old uh, Mikola back then helped his father decorate the local church here. And it was here after the cold St. Petersburg that he returned to be treated by the healing air. During uh, years of 1888 to uh, 1911, 11. The painter not only admired the picturesque nature, but also took deep roots here. He rented a house and built a large, bright workshop. He spent the whole summers here with his family. And about the workshop, actually, it's also interesting uh, that because he built a large workshop with uh, large glass doors that opened to the south, and um, like here he was painting some life figures, you know, some people in front of them, and like. Um, you know, was studying them in, in daylight and stuff like that. The northern part, though, was completely made of glass, and even the roof was made of glass, and uh, it was actually, like, this glass ceiling was covered by a dark rough curtain, which, well, if necessary, could be opened or closed. And basically, in Mikulas Pomlenko workshop, all facilities were created so that the master could work alone with his beloved nature with, without any distraction. And it was here, under the glass roof, that paintings of various subjects were born one after another. The Kish village life suggested the themes, and the colorful, in colorful inhabitants became prototypes of the canvases. With deep respect and sincere love, he praised the lives of simple workers. The most mundane scenes under his brush took on a touching lyrical sound and were colored with warm humor. And despite the illness, it was necessary to work. And now Pomonenko took the position of a senior teacher at the Kiev Drawing School. One of his students, Mokola Zhuk, who himself became actually then a famous Ukrainian artist, he remembered him like this. Mokola Kornilovich Pomonenko could not tolerate objections, but he was thoughtful and very attentive to his students. He taught them to carefully analyze nature to see its constructive structure. The first thing Pomonenko taught young people was drawing learn and be able to draw from nature as he was saying you know life figures from the original source he was saying he he, he was saying that uh like quote draw with a pencil never forget it and remember the pencil is your friend and teacher master the drawing write from nature write everything from nature first the pencil and only then paint paints but if we will talk about Pomonenko's um, works and his early works, you know, and how he was searching for his style and themes. So at first, uh, his themes and plots uh, was were unpretentious. However, they still, you know, spoke and worried the general audience. At the superficial exp uh, like inspection also, it seemed that nothing exceptional was visible in this paintings because he was depicting some work, some everyday life, some costumes, you know, something like the way home from the field, some evening meetings, some simple matchmaking, modest weddings, and etc. But behind these simple scenes, some moods and emotions were visible. We can say actually also the love of the creator to what he was doing and to these people that he was painting. Yay, one is ready after like, I don't know what, 15 minutes? 15 minutes on one square? That is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Yay, now we have three squares. Yay. But let's continue with Pimonenko. Mikola Pimonenko 
choose a nationally conscious path in life as evidenced by his choices, so he became a member of the Independent Exhibition Society of South Russian Artists, like here it Ukrainian painters, founded in Odessa on the initiative of local painters led by the general painter Mikola Skadovsky. Thus, Mikola Pomalenko joined the ranks of leading Ukrainian artists and became one of those painters who persistently built the foundations of modern, well, to him back then, national democratic art. But well, now we know that not very successfully, but at least they were fighting back then. Starting from 1885 to 1887, Mikola Pomalenko's work began to see persistent searches for his own theme, means of its presentation, a manner of presentation which indicated a steady progress towards an original style. And original paintings by the Kiev native appeared at the academic exhibition, such as, for example, after the auction, the artist, uh, this is the portrait of Hariton Platonov, on vacation, the reaper, and, well, on the last paint and the reaper uh, we will stop more in depth because this picture became for some time the well we can say the lead picture of national fine art so unfortunately i was not able to find those um pictures prior to the reaper that i named so i don't know where, whether they are even preserved or not where where they are or something very simple work right nothing really goes on here we can see there in depth in the background some more women working and this is an interesting um, manner you know of deepening your painting and uh, well it's historically important also because we can see the uh, the costumes we can see the clothes that our ancestors were wearing because well not much preserved at this point now because there was well, Russians apparently were very scared of Ukrainian vishavankas, uh, so so they, they were destroying all of that, and they were literally you could have been literally executed if you were wearing a vishavanka somewhere in a city or something like that. So so yeah, so this is a lot of our like artists and a lot of our literature geniuses, like writers. Yes, this word uh, were rebelling like that they were wearing vishavankas and stuff like this so so yeah and what is interesting also here for me is that women will be women always um so uh you know she's at work in a field it's hot it's hard it's a very hard work but she still needs to be beautiful she still has this coral necklace on her and this is very interesting for me and plus yes, this is a typical ukrainian face dark eyes dark hair this very like bushy dark um brows uh, i wanted to add here also is that i don't know it's for you but i have this feeling that why i said that it did i say it looks like a photo for me or no i don't remember where at this point okay but it looks like a photo for me and it looks like that you know the moment i will take my eyes of her she will continue working you know she, the, the Actions will continue after that because it looks like she just frozen frozen time for a second You know the artist called her. Can you look at me? She looked at him and he was like Thank you can go back to work and she will get back to work. So this is the thing that actually uh, Impressionists try to do, you know, this is one of the main goals of impressionism to you know catch this uh, brief moment but not a lot of them were able to put this invisible motion you know this future motion in this painting that's why for example i really like monet because he like claude monet because in his paintings you can constantly feel the movement you can constantly feel the future so we can say you can feel you know you're looking at these paintings and you're like yeah the moment like i will step out this painting was well you know like in harry potter start to move so uh, especially uh those paintings with his wife and kids uh, especially this very famous woman with parasol, you know, and she's standing like there's little just his little son in the background and it literally looks like they're you know, turned around second ago and they're looking at us and they're waiting and you know, basically saying like, hey are you coming? This is like a very nice you know, method of um, engaging viewers into the painting and here it is like the same for me uh, first of all, she's looking at us, so she looks like she's on uh, knowledge in us you know and this is also like 
how we can engage into this painting and plus also the stuff that um some of the figures like this figure on well i mean we're looking like that on her left um on our left on her right um this woman other woman that is behind her she's a bit you can see she's a bit like um, cut off cut out cut off how called correctly um and this also is um, a good method to show for painter that there is dimension you know not just on this canvas that we have not just here but something that goes on there also which again engage us as viewers into the painting so this is like very interesting also um but yeah let's move on <laughs> let's move on because i have another few paintings that i really, really want to talk about so a part of um you know day-to-day -day life of the villagers in Malutyanka that uh, Pomonenko was watching like every summer he was also studying some of the costumes the country costumes you know uh, in the villages uh, different celebrations different carols different um, the like understanding again of celebration of Christmas for example of Easter of such thing as Ivana Kupala so this is um, well, basically the analog of Midsummer and uh, yeah and he transferred what he saw these ritual actions and sacraments to the canvas and one of his early works which is again this is maybe his the most favorite painting which was called holiday divination of 1888 became the first valuable picture taken from the life of Malutyanka. and the picture was highly appreciated by critics and this is one of the most famous pictures in general on the ukrainian theme uh, in our country and again textbook definitely a textbook um picture so this painting also is like it's amazingly beautiful like on my taste you know this light that he was able to pick up this candlelight and everything so what i really like about this painting is that this painting feels like uh, you know it has more than one media what i mean um if we will look at the girls aprons and their skirts i don't know for you but for me well, like it looks so watercolory and uh, the other stuff was that um like the background for example it's the background just overall looks like it was not finished even <laughs> so, so like this and um again this very beautiful um like you know costumes we can see these necklaces which again historically very is important for us again i don't know how about you but for me i definitely feel myself like i am in the painting because first of all this light second of all again of this you know cut out of the frame and um just overall i don't know what what else but there is something in this painting even though the girls they are not looking into us you know so they're like not again not acknowledging us uh, but still i feel like that you know if i will get a little bit closer to the painting i will be able you know to look there and just see what, what these girls are looking into and what's there on on the wall which is again an, an amazing artist achievement you know to not use this very obvious method as i already said you know the eye contact and stuff like that but still be able to engage the viewer into the painting and even emerge us into the painting and gave and give us this feeling that we are there with these girls and we can you know hear this little whispers and what they're doing and to participate in this little uh well this little divination alexandra volodymyrovna his wife wrote in uh, her memoirs of, of him a uh, quote Mikola Kornilovich painted the best paintings in Malutyanka something imperceptibly took root in his mind nowhere will he be able to work as fruitfully as in this village among people he has known since childhood end of the quote and really like you know many of his best paintings were actually well created here so I already I already showed you two of them and naturally from the end of 1880s the leading theme of Mikola Pomonenko paintings became the multifaceted life of the Ukrainian village since then in painting the master was not ashamed to show simple feelings such as love and jealousy some sympathy and empathy and etc it's not by chance that the main motives of these general paintings became 
like meetings and datings of young people, some festive fortune tellings, jealousy, wedding, full of the housework and work near the land, and etc. etc. So, on this theme of dating and everything like that, I want to show you another of his work. Uh, this is also very like popular, the famous one. Uh, it's called Ukrainian Night um, Date, and it is his um, well, later right in English work. So, it's from 1905. So he still is uh, in Malitanka. Um and um, well, so we can see, you know, that this painting is uh, set in nighttime. Like obviously, you know, two young lovers, they are hiding maybe from her parents and everything. And for me, again, you can see the time in this painting. You can, and and even though it's called um, the date. Uh, for me, it looks more like some kind of a goodbye. Or maybe it's like the end of the date or something like that, because, you know, of how... Well, first of all, the posture of two people, of these young lovers. So, so this girl, you know, she's like hiding her face a bit. And I mean, we can see that she's kind of like smiling, so she's not really sad. And the man with the sword, so he is probably a Cossack, because this is like, you know very similar stuff Cossacks used, they, they, you know, like, took this from Turkish, like, Turks had this type of swords, and, um, yeah, so, so maybe it's kind of goodbye, but not, like, forever, or maybe he's, I don't know, promising something to her, maybe he's fooling her, uh, and thus she's not sad, or I don't know, but, um, we can also see that he's, you know, he's a little bit, like, um, what is this word? In Ukrainian also. Um, I don't remember. Tilt? Bent, bent. Yeah, that's a good one. He is a little bit bent to her, so you know, clearly that he is saying something to her, so we can clearly see that the action goes on there, right? And another stuff. We can also see that um, this probably goes on for quite a bit at this point, because this uh, poor horse, those of you who know who work with horse, um, you know this posture that they are doing sometimes with their back leg. So this poor horse probably is thinking like, my god, when will you finally say goodbye and we will go? So for me, it indicates that, you know, this date uh, was going on for quite a bit of time. Even though, you know, um, in terms of um, overall impression, in terms of um, the lightning, you know, this is supposedly a moonlight, obviously, but for me, uh, here, I don't really think that he was very successful in that, because, I mean, a part of, you know, if, if there were not, like, these stars, in, uh, like, in the sky, that you can see, um, I will not really say that, you know, I would say that this is some kind of, um, I don't know, you know, it looks like this, um, it, it looks like twilight, <laughs> with, you know, this blue and green filter, <laughs> Uh, because a lot of movies actually, if you paid attention, especially the older movies, well, older, I mean like early 2000s, like late 90s or like 90s, uh, they were sometimes uh, filming this, uh, like you can clearly see that the moonlight is actually the sunlight, but they just put it a filter, like a dark filter, because, well, obviously it's easier to shoot uh, during the day rather than during the night. So, I mean, here I have also this kind of, like, artificial feeling of this light, so that this one I don't really like. But, the, the again, the figures, like, this this part of the painting is, like, amazing. And plus, again, very important, historically, we can see the house, you know, we can see the house, again, we can see the their costumes, so what they're wearing, which is, again, very important, very important also the horse, we can see the uh, horse ammunition or how it called type. This sheer little band that uh, Pemonenko showed this guy, this Cossack, that he is leaning to the girl. This is like such a minor, like, right? Such a very, very minor detail, but it completely like spares this painting of static. This little detail gave so much action into the painting. And however, if we will talk overall, to be honest about the painting, um, here it, this painting for me, again, personally, it feels like a painting. Even though we have this two roads that I, again, they are getting out of the frame of the canvas. So they are again showing us that there is continuation of this nature of this, you know, of this place. 
somewhere somewhere there but for me it does not still you know play a uh, plus the tree also you know we can like imagine ourselves here yeah, we can enlarge this painting and see that something is going on there but here you know like still those details they are not given this perception that i am there you know i don't know how, again how about you but i don't have this feeling that i am um stalking these people <laughs> how to quote correctly you know that i am somewhere where i am not supposed to be that i'm witnessing something that i'm not supposed to witness you know i'm not supposed to see that i am you know that i'm not supposed to see this little like conversation of or again maybe this little even goodbye because for me it, it, it genuinely looks like it's a goodbye the genuinely looks that it is the end of the date and um yeah and it's just you know it just feels like a painting like this frozen moment and nothing more which doesn't make this painting worse than everything else because i really like this painting. again because of those really like the, those very small details that i said like told you but um yeah but compare compared to uh, like other two paintings that we got in depth here um it's well in this in this category like we lack we lack uh our like viewers present but sometimes i mean we don't need to be present in, in every paintings you know this is also the thing that we need to understand that sometimes uh, we are not wanted so viewers <laughs> as witnesses in the paintings and it's okay so let's move on with his life he was also a very prominent uh, portrait painter but uh, i decided you know that i will not um, stop very deeply into the portraits because again portrait portrait genre is uh, in its own league and we can talk about this also quite a bit uh, quite a lot but, but again we will skip that because that was like not his main main um you know um, genre uh it's just that for you to know that he had some portraits uh he was famous for his portrait also and the portraits are very nice and uh, he was showing starting from his family so the portraits of his wife and his uh, kids and ending with some um, philanthropists and in with uh, some businessmen, entrepreneurs and you know officials and etc etc and also actually she, he had like some of um tell me i'll tell you self-portraits yeah another thing also interesting that um kazimir malevich was um he's very big fan because so jan malevich uh, when he was just starting his journey as an artist uh, um he actually met mikola uh, Pomonenko and Mikola Morashko because he was like uh, he visited Kiev uh, drawing school and uh, yeah and, and it was just you know it's interesting that um, those two were the first professionals uh, professional artists whom the future avant-garde artist Malevich met in Kiev in 1895-1896 and uh, especially Kazimir Malevich um, he well I hope at this point all of you already know that he was a Ukrainian artist uh, he really adored his work like Pomonenko's work Hopak this painting when, he, when Malevich saw this painting he was stunned with that and this is why he was like I'm I will go and I will see this uh, artist in like in person and meet him in person so yeah and uh, well moving on that you know somehow neutrally the son of an icon painter moved to the top league of the fir like fine arts um in um russian empire back then in 1885 1896 then at the suggestion of a well-known specialist in art history and archaeology uh professor uh, adrian prajo uh, also very important like uh, person in uh, you know in the development of ukrainian art and architecture and art history and uh, stuff like that so um again at his, at his suggestion um, Pomonenko uh, was one of this many artists who painted the uh, Volodymyr Cathedral in Kiev uh, because um, was um, a part, I mean, I'm sorry, a part of Pomonenko there were also such um, painters as Vasnetsov, as uh, Mikhail Vrubel, as Nest Nesterov, as um, Katarbinsky, and etc., etc., very famous artists in our part of the world. 
In particular, um, Pimonenko executed the portraits of Saint Anna, of Saint Alexandra, and Saint Nicholas, and some images of the pediment. On January 1st, 1897, for these, for those impeccable frescoes, the painter received the imperial order of Saint Anna of uh, the third degree. However, despite uh, of, uh, despite the fact that he became quite a famous artist, he was not always lucky. In 1889, he requested that he be given a certificate of non-class artists, uh, artists so that he could freely teach in gymnasiums and other art institutions. However, he was refused. And well, don't ask me about all of this, uh, you know, stuff. I'm myself not very familiar with this uh, classifications and certificates and but well this is the system that was back then in uh, in uh, empire so Mikola Pomonenko who was regularly um, exhibiting at the academic exhibitions was puzzled by the by the chance chancellor who unofficially told him uh, what it is all about and he just said that um, they like the commission said that he m m I mean Pomonenko shouldn't be painting the shabby quote-unquote little Russia and various village dunk there. I will not even comment on this because I think it's, you know, it's very much clear, very clear what was said. But the stubborn patriot's answer was action. So he was like, okay, you don't want it, but I will still continue. I will still continue, and he sub submitted two canvases to the exhibition organized in 1891 at the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. Uh, first one, like, we a wedding in Kiev province, and uh, the second one, the morning of Christ's resurrection. And, well, both of the works caused a sensation, actually. So, on the painting, like, on the last painting, I want to stop a little bit, um, well, briefly. Enormously beautiful, I really like this painting. It, it has some, like, you know, much action here. And, uh, well, what is also very important that it's um, historically important to us, because we can see, you know, how this costume, like, um, how this costume was going on. And uh, we can see, you know, what people were wearing during this holidays and festives and how they were behaving, what type of um, social categories were there present and everything like that. This, like, bread that you can see on the ground, it's called kulich. So this is like our traditional stuff that we are preparing for uh, Easter. And uh, here uh, I will just stop. I mean, first of all, again, we can see that just there is a lot a lot of people are going this little wooden church but most of all i like this part um of the what is this left of the paintings i really like this um i mean you can see that everyone is doing like the, the there is this groups of people and every one of them is doing something i really like <laughs> this little um human group of two older no what elder elder women uh, that are you know talking and again you can see it was just this very small little gesture like this hand you can see right she's like with this hand she is telling something we can clearly see that she is talking she's doing like that <laughs> and this i don't know again it's for, for you but for me i can feel this movement i can feel this action that is going on and um, yeah, and you can clearly see they are very engaged in everything, but you can also clearly see that this little one is not engaged at all. And this is also very, um, very cute for me. I don't know how to call it correctly. Uh, yeah, that she's, this grandma, she's, you know, holding this. Well, it's not maybe grandma, it may be just a, um, um, tell me, I'll tell you, married woman. Uh, she's not specifically old, but. Uh, yeah, but she's holding this little one. This little one is sleeping because this is an early, early morning and she is sleeping sound. So. And also, I really like this grandpa in the background. He's having some existential crisis back then, back there. <laughs> so, yeah. And again, what I really like also is, um, again, in, in near this group of those two uh, women, uh, we have this uh, young girl standing. And also, I really like this because this again shows that um, she does not particularly look at someone, so she does not look at uh, look at those two grandmas or this like older women. She does not look at those beautifully dressed younger women. Uh, she just looks somewhere into the distance, somewhere outside of the painting. So again, 
enlarging the this like internal painting space into something bigger into something more like existential basically i don't know to quote correctly and uh, yeah and this beautiful little cherry trees and everything um so yeah but i mean i just wanted to stop here because i don't know why but i really like this group of two women you know just it, it's so again so mundane it's so like it's so casual you know it's so like everyday life and again this gesture this is the genius of painters that this gesture and actually actually i will figure it out another two characters so this little boy on the steps of the church it is he will like he want to get into that you can clearly see that he's watching on us you know he's spying with his little eyes on us viewers and again a bit like engaging us this is like we in modern time we're calling this breaking the fourth wall <laughs> so this is the same thing and there are actually another few characters that if you will look very like carefully on, on the right right in the crowd few of the men that are also looking uh looking on us for, for my feelings again it's just purely subjective feeling the different parts of this painting they feels differently and as i said this part no what well, this right part it does feel like we have some action some moment there but the part with the crowd is quite monumental for me and i in the contrary i don't feel um you know i don't really feel this moment you know this massive moment as one would thought to to feel i don't know maybe you have some different feelings this is also like completely fine and, um, i mean I, I forgot about to say about this maybe some of you will you know have some different visions and some different thoughts on this painting so obviously feel free to write them down in the comments it, like i mean if you want to share them um but um yeah also and i mean in terms of colors in terms of color and the light you know this is also another thing that i really want to to, to pick up here is that this candlelight you can i don't know about you but i can physically feel this light this is so you know it looks like someone made some holes you know in the painting and just put it some led lights there so this is how amazingly beautiful i think um yeah he was able to i mean you, we can clearly see that pomonenko was very like talented in painting artificial light let's move on so here we go finally chronologically to uh, his wife so they like i already mentioned her like her quotes few times but uh they were married in uh, 1893 so as i said he pomolenko married the daughter his teacher orlovsky alexandra orlovska and there were stories about her um deep intelligence and wit in kiev so she was kind of you know this very light bright figure meanwhile at her own wedding as if as you know like in this jokey manner we can say alexandra orlovska she uh, was like uh, she concluded an agreement with her husband that when she liked uh, like when she will like uh, like one of the paintings like really like it uh the canva would became her property and um mikola murashko uh, the artist and mentor of the groom jokingly signed this funny document as a witness uh, to this agreement and uh, well this is a, um, an important fact so remember it we will need it a bit later then in 1984 the ukrainian painter was recognized in, as an official member of the society of mobile art exhibitions until his death Pomonenko never missed their exhibition in 1901 like uh, this is this society is a very important one also for our development of art but i will not stop it here uh, like m maybe i will do like a separate video on that because it's very interesting very interesting stuff also and again as i said very important then in 1901 the key drawing school was closed unfortunately until his last days Pimonenko taught uh, drawing at the Faculty of Engineering at the Kiev Polytechnic Institute. At that time, um, drawing was a mandatory subject for engineers and builders. And Pimonenko was very popular at the, at, you know, very popular teacher in the institute. And for long term, term impeccable service, a full length portrait of the draw, of the drawing teacher, I'm sorry, was hung in the copy assembly hall and at the same time until 1906 Pomolenko gave lectures at the newly established Kiev art school where he uh, was one of the organizers on uh, October 25 1904 the council of the imperial um, St. Petersburg Academy of Science and Arts finally 
honored the Ukrainian with the title of Academician of Painting for his fame in the field of art. His works on the same theme of the village revealed his own style. He did not address complex and acute social issues, though, so we will not see that, uh, you know, some of the, uh, well, Russian, like Russian, Russian uh, painters, they liked to, to show, you know, these themes of like alcoholism and stuff like that. But Pomenenko and just overall, to be honest, our Ukrainian artists, they didn't really, they were not really interested in such um, deviant uh, themes. So, and in literature, also the same thing, like you will not find, I mean, you will, but it's not at such extent as in Russian literature, for example. And, uh, well, for him, uh, national beauty manifested itself not only in people, so it is like village themes, but also in nature. Uh, for Pomenenko, the landscape was never just a background. It was a factor uh, that completely decided the mood of the picture. In Malutyanko, his skill in conveying the light air environment was especially evident, and the master spent a lot of time uh, in nature and outdoors. At the beginning of the 20th century, the artist's work did not remain indifferent to the changes common um, to the art of this time. Now the artist's works became more decorative, the color became more juicy. Such a change in the palette could also be caused by a deeper understanding of folk art and also uh, like our decorativeness. The role of nature in the master's paintings is increasing and um, you know, works appear in which the landscape dominates the genre, such, for example, as the painting Before the Storm. Impressionist notes appear in Pomonenko work also, to this what I mentioned, so the artist managed to convey compositions that resemble a moment taken from life, again, that I saw, told you already. However, unlike the Impressionist, the basis of the works of the Ukrainian master is not the momentary impression of life, but a holistic view of the world. Uh, so this is kind of like, you know, this difference. Uh, for the artists who grew up in the traditions of spirituality, the main thing was the depiction of the psychological background of the characters, which also distinguished him from others, and especially from uh, impressionist, uh, impressionist foundations. Mikola Pomonenko and his wife Alexandra Vladimirovna, they are le regularly starting uh, from 19... Uh, I'm sorry, 1893, from their wedding trip to Germany, they traveled around the uh, like Europe, visiting different museums and galleries in Berlin, Munich, and Dresden, Paris, Rome, etc. And Mikola Pomonenko, he respected the classics, but he also followed the latest achievements of contemporary Western artists, especially the Impressionists, as I already said. Acquaintance with their plenary finds undoubtedly contributed to the manifestation of the Ukrainian painter's creative pursuit, as we can say. And since uh, 1904, the Ukrainian um, artists regularly exhibited abroad, again, in Munich, in Berlin, in Paris, in London, and etc. He was well uh, acquainted with the matters of European art, as the painter's wife, Alexandra Vladimirovna, uh, recalled among the old artists that the husband especially appreciated uh, the works of uh, Rembrandt and uh, the Spanish um, Spanish painters uh, Diego Velázquez and José de Ribera. Uh, he was also familiar with the works of modern artists. Among his contemporary colleagues, he really liked uh, the Frenchman Jules Breton and Carole Durand, uh, Arnold uh, Böcklin, also the Swiss man, and German Ludwig Knaus. There was an interest in, in his paintings abroad. So in 1904, one of the Munich museums, uh, sorry, I will not even try to pronounce it, uh, they uh, acquired uh, the author's painting Exit from the Church on Monday, like Monday, Thursday. Um, and how it all happened. So remember this story about this little contract, as we can say, between um, Alexandra and Mikola. Uh, so uh, Alexandra Orlovska, she expressed a desire to take this painting. So again, this deal that we talked about earlier. However, she did not take it for herself. She actually just uh, sent it to an exhibition abroad, well, in Munich, in Germany, where the painting was so like that the Munich Museum bought it. The National Art Museum of Ukraine, uh, now we have um, the author's copy in smaller size that was created at the end of 1907. The Germans liked the canvas so much that the organizers gave it a place of honor in hall number one of the Munich Palace of Arts. And by the way, along with the works of his favorite Böcklin and Knaus, 
and it was like a real European triumph of the son of a Kiev icon painter. This painting already that I mentioned, Hopak, uh, was exhibited in the Paris Salon of the Society of French Artists, so La Société des Artistes Françaises, and was purchased by the uh, by actually Louvre. So and it is there now. And the author himself was honored for the work by local academicians with the gold medal from the uh, Paris Salon of the Society of French Painters. So. Um, yeah, very high <laughs> praise. Among other things, in 1907, the son of a Kiev icon painter became a member of the Society of Munich Artists, and in 1909, he was selected a valid member of the International Union of Arts and Letters, so uh, Union Internationale de Beaux Arts de Lettres in Paris, and uh, also the diploma was signed by several outstanding artists, including the sculptor Auguste Rodin. One more thing uh, should be also noted about his art is that although Pimonenko is primarily remembered and uh, you know propagated as a praiser of a Ukrainian village, he was nevertheless very well acquainted with urban culture also, and he was quite um, he has quite a lot of works on urban themes which are again historically important because after all we can see old cityscapes, urban fashion of Ukrainians at the time and etc. So here in this like city landscape theme, I will uh, stop on the on, on the two paintings, uh, and um, we will like compare a bit a little bit. So first, of, like we will see the overall. Um, I'm not tell you no. The example of urban uh, urban theme uh, like paintings on urban theme, and plus we will compare how his style changed to you like you know throughout his his career. Both of the paintings are called Key of. Um, Flower seller, Kiev florist, I don't correctly translate it. The first one was um, painted in 1897, the second one in 1908. You can clearly see the difference. You can clearly see in this latest one how Impressionism was uh, um, influencing Pimonenko and how interested he was in Impressionism. And you can clearly see how he stepped out from this realism. And plus, overall, the mood also changed because i don't know this this um later one of 1908 it's such a gloomy work and i mean like it's i don't know it's such a sad work it's such a like such existential work i would even say uh, very moody very blue as we can say yes and this you know just this woman she just stands there and she's just like, looking like into into the void i don't know into nowhere um it's again you know it's a painting like this painting is on its own as i was saying with this painting dating you know with these two lovers that it's not that i am not invited as a, as a viewer into the painting but it's not also that i'm completely that i'm completely out of this painting you know it's they just this painting just exists in its own time in its own space and you know and and we as a viewer, we exist in a completely different time and space and stuff like that. While the earlier work, more this realistic one, the mood is way, way happier. But this one is important because we can see the streets, we can see how uh, things look like, and we can see the fashion of the city. We can see this, you know, this uh, two figures, this couple, uh, like on the background there was like this woman with the parasol. We could see how more noble people were. Uh, walking around and what fashion they had uh, in uh, like in in Kiev, uh, we can see those two, this like two women, uh, this uh, flower seller, and on 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 the right uh, on the background also, uh, they are clearly not so rich, uh, but uh, we can also see the the city fashion. So you, you see, we, there is no this embroidered shirts, nothing like that. So it's more again urban. Also pretty static works. I mean, I, I like, I think that I like this one more, this um, earlier one, but still, it's not very inviting, as we can say. It still does not feel like I belong there and that she sells those um, flowers to me directly. But uh, yeah, but this is just an interesting, you know, when I was just like, what, like looking through his pictures, I just, you know, I picked these two paintings and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And you can clearly see how the artist was evolving and what interests he, he had in, during, like, you know, different period of times of his career. Let's move on. We're almost at the end, at the finish. 
So a part of this, he had obviously a, a lot more of different uh, urban uh, works, and well, I will try to show you as much as possible while talking. But um, yeah, so again, very interesting. Also, different. Uh, he was paying interesting not what he's paying attention to, some details and everything, and very important for us historically, because we can see how Kiev lived in, like, at the beginning of 20th century. But, well, unexpectedly, at the beginning of 1912, the master fell ill again. Soon an abscess in an inflamed liver was diagnosed, and... um, the painter, so Mikola Pomonenko, overall, he, a part, like, you know, this, uh, well, I think it, it might be the result of uh, constant tuberculosis also, but uh, he had a very weak heart, and those, a really famous uh, surgeon, Mikola Markianovic Volkovich, he, uh, well, he refused to operate him, and he did not dare to operate, to make, a, I'm sorry, to make a surgery uh, on, like, on the patient. And after suffering for two months, as Mikola Kornilovich Pomalenko, Pomalenko passed away in the prime of his creative powers at just the age of 50. And he died on March 26, 1912 in Kiev. One of the founders of the National School of Realistic Art was mourned in Voldemort's Cathedral, which he like helped paint. And in the presence of the highest Ki- Kievan clergy, was buried at the uh, cemetery on Lukyanivka. So this is again part of the Kiev. And at the Pospolnus exhibition at the Academy of Art held at the beginning of 1913 at the, um, in, in St. Petersburg, 184 paintings, uh, 419 sketches, 112 pencil drawings by a Ukrainian artists uh, were exhibit- exhibited. In general, the painting heritage of the outstanding general artist includes more than a thousand works, including several hundred finished oil canvases that are now are uh, well, all around, at least Europe. We cannot say the world, but at least Europe. So, yeah, this is everything that I have for today for you. And, well, I was very, to be honest, um, I don't know about you, but I was very entertained um, to talk about uh, an artist, finally, because we haven't talked about artists for quite a bit. And it was, yeah, very nice to finally, you know, look at the pictures, like, uh, the paintings and, like, analyze them a bit and just, you know, just have some feelings about that. But, well, what did I do? this <laughs> this is everything that i've done so this is like what one two three four five six seven eight nine nine square like and i already had two prepared like yeah um and i need 74 i believe so i don't know where i will be able to show you that project and well i hope that i will, co- will you know continue on working with that but well um yeah, this is everything that I have for today. We will continue on with um, artists in, in the next videos, I believe. Yeah, most definitely. Because, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed today's video very much. And, uh, yeah, so stay safe. Uh, stay healthy. You know, wear some masks. Wash your hands. Because that is literally happened overnight. You know, I spent the whole day yesterday with my mother at, like, one place we needed to do some documents. And, you know, that was just the place where, like, a lot of people were there. And everyone was sneezing and coughing. And all of this was doing, you know, still after, like, what, two years of COVID? Of this instruction that when you're sneezing and coughing, like, like that. Or in the, like, fucking tissue. No, everyone was sneezing into their arms. And then these arms, they're going around touching everything and everyone. And I just believe that I caught someone's virus or bacteria. I don't know. And it just like overnight, you know, I wake up today and I was like, uh, what the hell? <laughs> you know, barely could speak because like the throat is what was, was killing me. And yeah, because overall, you know, this it's kind of strange virus because you like, I feel myself completely fine. Like I don't have any temperature. I don't have, um, like, I have a little headache, but it's like normal like, because of the nose mostly, not because like of the virus itself. And plus the weather, it's like, really... <laughs> It's not, but the weather is not alright, and uh, yeah. But overall, so again, masks, what, um, sanitizers, <laughs> washing your hands, and please, please, don't sneeze and cough into your arms. No, 
Uh -huh. So, yeah. Uh, the year so far is hard. You know, just um, four days passed. <laughs> Two of them were under a very, like, bad, massive rocket attack. And the, the last year ended the same way. And, um, well, you know, I don't know what to expect from this year. If this is how we are starting it. But, well, yeah.